I was like losing sleep worried about this. I'd never been on a podcast. I really struggled with social anxiety disorder my whole life. And so like, this is my worst nightmare, but I knew it was an opportunity. And so I did one shot of whiskey, then two, and I do the interview. And at the end they go, oh, you're really good at that. Good job. I was like, oh my gosh, the brilliant thing I did. I said, hey, are there any other podcast hosts, you know, that would benefit from having me on their show? And he introduced me to one. And that person at the end goes, you know, you're a natural. What? You're a natural. You should host your own podcast. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we have Kurt Elster on the podcast. Super excited. Kurt is a Shopify expert. He's the host of the unofficial Shopify podcast, owner of EtherCycle Agency, and author of Kurt Elster's newsletter. Kurt, thank you so much for coming on the show. No, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was a mouthful, man. You've accomplished so much. I love to kind of just start every episode. One, if you don't notice, we just get it rolling right off the bat. And then two, it's tell us who Kurt Elster is. Like, let us know a little bit more about you. Sure. I mean, if you have someone, describe yourself who you are. <laughs> I'm a 40-year-old dad from the Chicago suburbs. But how people see me, I think probably number one, I'm best known for hosting that podcast, which I greatly enjoy. It's been uh, like 500 episodes. And That's I've, amazing. I've learned a lot. We go back and listen to the early ones. I'm like, oh, this is, this is <laughs> rough. <laughs> You just get better over time. And, but no, I, I graduated into a, the 2008 recession, the housing crisis, and I couldn't get a job. It was a struggle. And so I knew my only option was like, all right, take a job I'm not going to enjoy or grind it out myself, which is not easy you know, going into a recession, but I knew what I was getting into. And so I said, I'll start. I'm not There's a big advantage of being ignorant to how difficult something is. I just said, uh, I got a friend. He knows development and he's on fun employment. Why don't uh, we just try and build an e-commerce platform together? Well, it turns out that's really hard. And then yeah. just like long way around, you know, probably two, three years later, we end up developing for Shopify, Shopify themes, because we knew web development and very quickly moving in just saying, well, why are we doing anything else? Let's just do Shopify theme work exclusively. And that was, uh, geez, 12, 13 years ago. I just didn't look back after that. That's amazing. And I know um, the podcast is about Shopify. You kind of have Shopify expert in your title. As an entrepreneur who built businesses online, Shopify was always a little bit of a black hole for me. I felt like the website portion of the business was hard and how to have the right website and drive the traffic and all these like little things. I would read posts about someone's like, I increased the size of my buy now button by three inches and my conversions up 48%. And mm -hmm. I was like, man, mm -hmm. how do you like maybe talk a little bit about Shopify, like some of like your journey kind of creating on Shopify and maybe some tips for someone like myself who it's like, man, this is this is really confusing. Maybe some basics. Sure. And so for us, it was, we had a, a friend who owned a bike shop locally. It's Amling Cycle, which is if you're in the Chicago area and you want a recumbent bike, right? Like these are the guys. This is the place to go. And they had a, he goes, look, I got a website. I hate it. I know I have to have a website. I don't want to hate it. You know websites. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> I said, like, what's your number one priority? What do you want out of this? And he goes, I just want it to be easy. And I had heard of Shopify. We'd seen it. This is a long time ago. This was probably, you know, 2011 and maybe 2010. And we said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try Shopify. And again, like there's power in ignorance because I said, well, we've done some WordPress work. We've built some websites. How tough could this be? We'll just, we'll design and develop a custom theme for Shopify, a platform we'd never used before. And we'll <laughs> migrate the store onto it, having never done that either. Because Shopify was so well documented and the support was good, we were able to get through it. And at the end, we went, well, that was easy. You know, like at the same time, we were building these custom sites for small businesses and we we're doing brochure sites and like WordPress and doing WordPress sites fulfillment for creative agencies. And so we we're comparing it to that experience. And we went, well, this was easy because it was well documented. Is it like a few more experiences like that? We went, well, why are we doing anything else? But there's <laughs> Shopify at that time was starting this thing called the Shopify Experts Program. And you said, you have Shopify Expert in your title. That's where it came from. And sadly, there that got sunset at the end of May. I believe. And that program, they said they reached out, uh, this man named Dan Evelay in, in Ottawa, Ontario at Shopify HQ. And he said, well, you built a custom Shopify theme. Clearly you know what you're doing. You should join our experts program. So, okay, I'd yeah. love to. And it was all Sounds because great. we built the site. It said like, you know, site by ethercycle.com. 
somewhere in there. And so he, re he found me, reached out, and I was like, yeah, why would I say no to that? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. give me those leads. Because I didn't, I knew, like, for sure we could sell this stuff, but how do you get the leads? How do you get them consistently? That's the struggle. Yeah. And so, like, any opportunity, I was willing to take a chance. And so we, we said yes. And sure enough, the second lead I get through it is Bandon Dunes Golf Course. If you're into golf, this is a big deal. It's in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, and it's like a Scottish-style golf course. It's really cool. And they said, well, you got, you know, we got a new site. We need a, a merch store to match. Build it. And so like this great brand drops in my lap and it's just like one after another. And so there's a, there's a lot of advantage in being early to a platform, but when you're on a platform and it's growing or you're on a platform and it is evolving and Shopify is doing all, both of those things because new features are changing constantly. And so if you're on the theme or if you're on the platform, you want the latest and greatest. Well, maybe you got to upgrade to a new theme or you got to add these. You need somebody there who can assist you some of the time. And so just the success of the platform creates work for people who know web development. And that's true today. And it was true 10 years ago. Yeah, you know, when we found that we went like, all right, these are our people because this is... <laughs> This stuff's well documented. Good. Yeah. We just did look back. So you're saying the leads are kind of falling on your lap. How are you monetizing that? Do you have to go through Shopify to charge for the client work? Or are you able to kind of just set your price? Or is it just pro bono work that you're doing to improve your brand? At this time, we build them directly. I love the idea of fixed price projects. I still do that for large projects. Smaller stuff, we still set hourly retainers. But for big fixed price projects, it takes a lot of the risk out of, of things. And you know, yep. like I'm getting paid X and I have to deliver Y. You know, the very, very traditional transaction when you break it down that way. But if you bid too low or you get your, you know, there's stuff in the scope you missed, then all right, you're going to start eating into that effective hourly rate. But so no, we, everything was handled outside of Shopify. We build the client directly. They pay us directly. Shopify doesn't set the rates. For sure, you know, you got enough people. There's kind of like market rates that happen. There's averages that occur. But the range is still huge. You could pay a thousand dollars for a Shopify store, you could pay fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for a Shopify store. It depends on you know what you're doing, what you want, who you're hiring. You know, sort of a, a how long is a piece of string question. And I don't, you know, certainly it's not unique to Shopify. That's most plat like WordPress, it's the same deal. You know, any big platform with a lot of customization will do that. Yeah. And, and so like I know web development is is something tough because the price does vary, like you just mentioned. And it's hard to as an outsider comprehend like what am I getting? So I mean this question might be complicated, but if I'm paying somebody a thousand dollars for a website and I'm paying somebody fifty thousand dollars for a website, what is that fifty thousand dollar person providing that is so much more worth it? Because in my head, it's just like, oh, you build the site and it looks really cool. And I've I've seen thousand dollar sites look amazing. Like, what's that gap? What are some of the things that come from that? So I think the in the broadest sense, when you you pay the huge money up front, the thought is, you know, I'm paying them so much money to get the best and for them to worry about this instead of me. And I'm de-risking the project and I'm de-risking my business in the process. And so I think that's you know what those big agency hires represent for people is reduced risk. And with a business investment, of course, that's what you want. And like all marketing is an investment and like any investment, it carries inherent risk. And so if I have someone that's like part of a team that has a proven track record where they could show me like we have done the similar to what you want we have done those things in the past and here are the results you can see them for yourself firsthand and do you like it and if you do then that's why you're willing to pay for it because you know they have a proven track record of success and so this you know those the consultants freelancers and agencies that could charge those eye-watering rates generally it's going to be backed up by a ton of social proof and case studies and a, a portfolio and a work history where they feel confident in saying, you know, we're generating so much value here that you should, that the, the amount we're charging really is nominal relative to like the class of work and the, the product we're producing and how it's used. Yeah. I love that. I always love like different thought processes and way people look at things and you saying by you paying a significant amount more, you're de-risking the experience from your end it is very true because now it's on them to deliver at that, like a value that makes up that ticket price of let's say 50K, hypothetically speaking. It's on them now to really show up and deliver that. And if you're a business that's ready for that and has that cash flow, that might be perfect for you. And then on the other end, you have like a new creator, somebody new who doesn't have 50,000 and needs to go with the cheaper budget. And that kind of frames up a question I have. So for people listening, because I'm sure there's going to be people in the audience who are either on the fence of starting a business or have started a business, do you recommend that individual 
individual play around with how to build a website, how to create a website, or just immediately outsource to somebody who knows what they're doing and can really help them? I think always start with trying to do it yourself. Even if you know, like whatever the project is, if you plan on hiring out for it, plan it out and it like research it and get as far as you can with a with doing it because then you'll have a much better understanding of it. You'll be much more confident talking about it and you'll be able to talk the talk. Like you will have an easier time talking it through, explaining it and understanding what's going on with a, a professional that does it so much. Like they don't even realize anymore when they're being technical. And so they're, yeah, absolutely. And then like, maybe, you know, when you take that pressure off of is like, I have to do this and it becomes, I'm going to attempt this so that I know how to like how to hire for it. Yep. Maybe you get lucky and you succeed, right? But now you've taken the pressure off where like you're going to be less frustrated because you framed it in your head as like I have an out here if I get in over my head. Once you're in it, you know, maybe you get all the way to the end. Maybe you succeed. Maybe you're like, all right, I got a, a site up and this is good enough to to start with and launch with and validate the idea and reduce some of that capital outlay. And then you, you know, you get a hun- one sale, then 10, then a hundred, and then by then you go, all right, well, maybe I've got more experience. I know the things I don't like and the customers complain about. Now I'll hire for it. But by that point, you're going to be much more confident in what you're doing with your site. Yeah. And, and I love that point because I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make up front. And I think like social media and Twitter especially plays into it where everybody speaks on this amazingly automized business where they've got a million people working for them. And that seems to be the normal. But if you don't sit there and really get down into the weeds and learn these individual processes, whether you succeed or not, you're going to have a much tougher time hiring for those roles because you don't know what to look for. And you're also susceptible to getting ripped off because at the end of the day, we want everybody to be a good person, but we know that's not true. So you are de-risking that experience. I know we're on the de-risk topic here. You're de-risking that experience by going in and learning the bare minimums about these tasks. And like you said, maybe you stumble upon it and you're great and that's good. And now that's overhead you don't need. But at the worst case scenario, you at least understand what's needed to fulfill that task. And then you can go higher effectively, which I I love. So I think that's a great highlight there. I want to kind of shift gears to the podcast. We're on a podcast right now. I'm on my journey as a podcast podcaster, something I've always been really passionate about. You mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you've done over 500 episodes on your show. Talk to me about that journey, like just how that's been from episode one to now 500 plus. So the certainly like today, there's so many tools that make it so much easier. (laughs) Like to do a a podcast interview, we used to have to record on Skype with an app called, and then there was a third party app called Call Recorder. Oh, it was disaster. (laughs) Like it was so compressed and nasty and there was no chance of doing video. Like it just wasn't going to happen. But now I started with someone said, Hey, it was on this podcast It's for agencies. They wanted referrals. You want to do it? I said, sure. And then I was terrified. And I was like worried about like losing sleep, worried about this. I'd never been on a podcast. I really struggled with social anxiety disorder my whole life. And so like, this is my worst nightmare, but I knew it was an opportunity. And so I did one shot of whiskey, then two, you know, why not get like extra drunk for this, right? I'm a genius. (laughs) Covered in flop sweat. And I do the interview. And at the end they go, oh, you're really good at that. Yeah. Good job. I was like, oh my gosh. And so (laughs) the brilliant thing I did, I said, hey, is there anyone else? You Like, I just assumed all podcast hosts knew each other. <laughs> and I was like, oh, are there any other podcast hosts, you know, that would, would benefit from having me on their show? And he introduced me to one. And that person at the end goes, you know, you're a natural. What? You're a natural. You should host your own podcast. And this is like before Serial, before NPR blew up podcasting for us. And I was like, no way. You're just saying that. Third person says the same thing to me. I said, all right. What they're hearing is nervousness and they're misinterpreting is like confidence, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and so I, I was like, all right, I want to do a podcast, but editing it seems really hard. And my business partner at the time goes, hey, dummy, you know, my first gig, it was like, or I used to edit the Onions AV Club podcast, which was their first podcast. I was like, no, I did not know that. And once I had that, now I don't have any excuses. Now I just have to go buy, you know, and I spent $30 on like the cheapest USB mic off Amazon I could find because I didn't know if this was going to (laughs) work. And I committed to like, I'm going to publish like six episodes and I published them and then I ignored it and I looked back and they were getting downloads. And I said, okay, what happens if we just do this regularly? What if we do once a week? And I bought a slight, you know, slightly better mic. And then that was it. I mean, just committed every, we're going to publish every weekly and we like, we miss a few. And then I got sponsors. Now it's a client deliverable. Now there is no option to not publish, right? Like Lord Michael's talking about SNL is this great quote. He says, the show doesn't go on because it's done. It goes on because it's Saturday at 10. Like that's, or Saturday at 11, whatever SNL is. And that really, really changed things for us because 
it turns out publishing consistently is absolutely critical. And to the point where like that became part of the description of the show, which is the new episodes every Tuesday. And that doesn't seem like a crazy thing to say, but it immediately demonstrates you as committed. And people are, I think, more likely to give it a shot, more likely to subscribe when they know you are serious about it. And so once I got that figured out, all right, like there's some lessons and there's some learning, but it was just keep keep producing, keep booking guests, and not everything works and not everything was a winner, but you get better at it, just progressively better. What are some highlights looking back from that, like some high points? And then also, what are some low points? Because I feel like people don't like to talk about the times when they're tough, but that's very important for people listening, deciding if they want to jump in and do something. So what are some of the highlights from your experience interviewing over 500 people or if there's double episodes, three, 400 people, which is an amazing accomplishment. And then what are some of the low points or tough parts about that journey? All right. So for sure, there was a big advantage early on because I had, I think of it as like a Trojan horse, but when you're doing outreach and you're trying to get people to talk to you and you have nothing to offer them, it's tough. Whereas the podcast gives you that opportunity where you go, Hey, I host this podcast and I, I really want to hear your story. I'd love to talk to you for 30, 40 minutes. I just hear your story. Same as to how you pitched me. And, you know, everybody's favorite topic is themselves and everyone is the hero in their own <laughs> story, right? And so, yeah. like, it's just such an easy universal pitch. And then you get to, we don't know each other, and yet you get to ask me all kinds of deeply personal questions. And I yep. will open up and share them to you if I'm a decent guest. <laughs> and so, like, it really um, is this incredible, a podcast is an incredible tool for getting to know whoever will join you and come on. And so doing that, really, it's just, and for someone like me where, I don't necessarily want to go to conferences and I don't want to cold email or cold call people. This was a great way to handle it. Or now I can expand my network. I could, if I see someone interesting, I'm like, hey, will you do my show? And a lot of people just ignore me. They don't necessarily say no, they just ignore me. Maybe they're busy, but they didn't say no. So I could always follow up later. Yep. And plenty of people are like thrilled by the opportunity to do it. And so I'm like, yeah, please come on. And we just have a normal conversation as far as the low lights. You know, later, eventually I got enough guests where I was able to build a back catalog. Like typically I have, you know, four to eight episodes recorded. And that way I'm, I'm comfortable and I'm not worried about like, well, we have to put something up Tuesday. Early on, there were definitely several weeks where it's like, it's Friday and I need something for Tuesday. What do we going to do. And so you, you don't have a choice. You've got to scramble. you got to come up with something. And occasionally those would like that forced creativity. You'd come up with some cool stuff that you might not have done otherwise. And other times you're just like, well, I put someone on who essentially just performed a 40 minute infomercial on my podcast. And I'm not thrilled about it, but what were we going to do? And occasionally I go back and delete those. Like, you know, total published episodes right now is like 400 something. But in reality, the show had over 500. But yeah, over time I go, I'll, once they, and I let them sit for years and then I'll go back, delete a few. I just want, want higher quality. I want to curate my my collection for people. Because there, there's like maniacs will start from the beginning. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> don't, do it. don't start until like, start in 2020. That's when things are really rocking. But no. And then, you know, not now, but like I started it. And then like 2015, I got married. And so there's a lot of like transition and upheaval in my life. And at that time, like emotional issues. There's like fighting with my family. And there was one episode where like, I'm just like, you could hear. I'm just on edge. I'm annoyed. Eventually deleted it years later. But yeah, like you could tell there was something not right. At least I could. And like people who'd listened enough were like, that guy, he, they didn't know, but they don't know the reason. They just assume like this guy's pissed at the guest. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> that guest's fault. It was like, you know, a family member said something horrible to me. Oh, good. Now, like that's how I get, you know, that when you get like those awful messages, it's always like, oh, it was five minutes before you have a meeting, <laughs> five <laughs> minutes before you're going to record. Now today with experience, I know that you'd go, hey, like what I do now is I, I take the call. I go, look, it's not a great day for me to record. We're not gonna be able to do our best work together, but instead let's do a pre-interview. Like let's wa let's work out an outline together. And then those episodes end up often, I think, having a better result. The few times, like there's a handful of episodes where like, you know, there's like three where we lost the recording and we had to re-record. And so I knew mm -hmm. like generally the, the re-recording is like a dramatic recreation. But it's often better, you know, than the other one. And so I knew like, all right, if you those pre-interview episodes, oftentimes that could be beneficial. Yeah. And I think for me, like we share a little bit of similarity from I'm doing this because of the fact that I get to interview people like you and ask them questions as a complete stranger. And I've mentioned it on multiple episodes before this. It's like before I start to ask something, I'll say this is a super selfish question, but I have you here. So, and it's truly amazing. And like the little phrase that I've been using is podcasting is networking at scale. Networking, you just want to meet people, but I get to do it at scale. And 
create content from it and hopefully create lasting relationships. And I think that was really what pushed me to finally go do it. I was always a consumer of podcasts. And when I built my businesses in college, my biggest regret looking back was that I didn't use social media the right way. The businesses were very successful without social media. They didn't need it. They were built all on Discord and that was fine. But I had so many followers and like people using my service coming in and out for years that I didn't capitalize on. And now I'm looking back and I was like, you know what? I need to stop being shy and put myself out there. Podcasting is the way I'm going to force myself to do it. And then now we're here. And I think it's been such an amazing ride. And to touch on something that you mentioned, the commitment to your audience to where you're like, I need to put out that episode every week. I love that because I do agree. Like when I click on a podcast that I might have not heard of, or it might have been a recommendation and I go in and I'm like, man, this person's been uploading every week for a year and a half. They're taking this really serious. Like this isn't just something they're doing for fun. They must be putting a lot of time and effort in the episode. Let me listen and try and gain some value. So I love you kind of calling out those little things like like that where it shows your commitment to the audience because they're putting time into listening to us here talk and I appreciate that because they could be using that time for a bunch of other things but they committed to listening to us so we must be talking about something good look um, shout out to the people who are like yeah. mowing their lawn doing their dishes <laughs> walking the dog right now exactly I know at least somebody's like oh they're watching us <laughs> Exactly. Like that is what I do it for. And early on, like we're not getting these hundreds of thousands of views per episode, but even with the couple of views that trickle in and they've been growing every episode, I get messages from people saying, Hey, thank you. That was an amazing episode. Like that really made my day more exciting or like, wow, I learned so many great things from this person who I've been struggling to get in contact with or haven't, haven't been able to reach out to. And I just learned so much about them. Like this is super impressive. Like, thank you. So like, those are the little things that I really enjoy, but enough about me <laughs> back to you, the agency. Tell us a little bit about that. How did the agency come about? What does the agency offer now? Like, let's hear a little bit about that business. 2009, my plan was, and then they just called it EtherCycle. It was a portmanteau of Ethernet and Bicycle because we said, we're <laughs> going to build an e-commerce platform. Like, and even then I knew the importance of like, you needed a niche audience. And so I said, it's going to be just bike shops because that's underserved. And it, that I had worked in a bike shop. I'm a SRAM certified bike mechanic. Like that felt familiar to me. And, but I also knew I built websites. I been involved, you know, in the internet because I'm, I'm 40. Like I watched it when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet. And then all of a sudden, like by the time I'm a teenager, everybody is online. And so I, I witnessed that. I grew up with it. And, but it, you know, building an e-commerce platform, it turns out way too difficult, but we <laughs> like, we knew web development. And so this is out of desperation because I straight up, I just had to pay the rent to keep the lights on or I was going to lose this office that I got. I walked around, we were in um, Park Ridge, Illinois, and it's like an uptown area. It's cute. It's quaint. We walked around. And I wrote down all the businesses that I'm like, you know, that's a cool shop. That's a cool shop. That's like, I'd, I'd work with them. I wrote them all down. And then I, I went online and I figured out the owner's first name for all these businesses. And then I wrote a letter of introduction. I said, hey, I'm Kurt. I, we moved into the Pickwick building. We're on the second floor and we do web development. And you know, I grew up in Park Ridge. I love it here. I just wanted to introduce myself. And I included uh, my business card as a magnet in there. And then I hand wrote every business owner's name on the envelope in marker. And that was it. Just their first name. I got up at 5 a.m. because I did not want any to see me doing this. And I walked around and I stuck those hand-marked envelopes. I slid it under each person's door and I got leads from that for two years. People being like, wow. hey, I got your card. I think, uh, can you help us with our website? We And it, like at that time, it was people like, we need a website. They never had one before. And so we're just like building brochure websites and, you know, I'd sell them and then I was like slowly ratcheting up the cost. So the time, like when I sold one for 2000 or 7000 like a few thousand dollars for the first time, I was like, is this even legal? Like, am I even allowed to do this? Should I tell the IRS? I mean, how does this work? Right? Like, I think when you're early in the business, you're looking for someone to give you permission because you were trained to be an employee, right? To be a student, to be like part of some larger organization where all your experiences, now you're on your own and you are responsible for everything. And so that's, that's a little weird. And once I got, you know, those people, I said, I wonder if that same trick will work with bigger clients. And so I found, you know, we were 15, yeah, 15 miles from downtown Chicago. And so I looked up the big creative agencies at downtown Chicago and I did the same thing and lower hit rate, but it worked. And so we worked with a marketing agency. We got to build a design and build a site for uh, Verizon for a marketing campaign. Wow. Okay, sweet. So now I have Verizon in my portfolio. That's and amazing. I got another one. We built a site for a Hilton hotel. They had like a boutique hotel. We did dev on this site. Uh, so now I get to stick that in there. And that was 
those projects were grueling and ex they that was immediately i'm already in like the 50 grand to build these things and they don't even think twice about it but also it's like your project manager you know quits or gets fired every six weeks you know there's always like there's always something at those places going on that messes with you and you're low man on the totem pole and so yeah. you know at that same time that we'd gotten that far that's when our that shopify business was starting to take off and develop and if one stressed me out and i didn't have a ton of control but it was high dollar the other i had way more control i'm working with entrepreneurs and small business owners and i'm like these are my people these are who i'm comfortable with and shopify is well documented and i like this so why don't we try just doing only this for a while and we were like let's do e-commerce yeah and so i we did like just for the sake of it try some others like we tried i sold get this google adwords worked so well at that time that i built a landing page that was like hey you know, like we'll develop a website for you and I would just swap out the name of the platform and then run Google ads to it. And we got leads that converted and closed. And so it's like, all right, I'm going to build a site on Lemon Stand. I'm going to build a site on, I don't even think that's around anymore. Big Commerce, Magento, like just ran through all of them. And so I had the experience in all of them. And I was like, nah, still like Shopify the best. <laughs> and they said, well, let's just do exclusively that. And so that's where like the podcast came from, was born out of that. Cause I'm like, I need, you know, I can't be sticking envelopes under people's doors, <laughs> but we were getting leads from Shopify through the Shopify experts program now ended this year, sadly. And that podcast where it's like, all right, we're just going to do content marketing, just going to document what we do and share what we do and talk, you know, like we'd have a client and then I'd, I'd be like, Hey, this is a cool project. You want to talk about it with me on the podcast? And it was a cool project and I was proud of it, but like, and you get to hear their story, which I may or may not have known in sharing that obviously like you attract similar people with similar problems because they find that content and so it becomes a, a flywheel which that's the thing yep. like once you have that it's such a that hustle and grind is just like you're trying things in the dark you know you've got a candle in a cave and you're just like trying stuff trying stuff trying stuff and then well we found something and i'm like now you can see a little more and you just keep going and then suddenly you develop this marketing flywheel where it's like all right as long as you keep to the process and you keep publishing and you keep doing the work and you, you keep going through it you'll refine it and get better at it and it progresses and accelerates and i love when businesses work like you've got like this beautiful thing built here where not only does your podcast drive you leads because it's all about what your agency does but when you get leads from your agency, you can turn a successful project into an episode of the podcast. And it's just nonstop. And then you're able to write about it on the internet and post that as a newsletter. And you're able to reach more people. And it's like, you don't have to go out and find all of these different ways to make yourself entertaining to the public, you're kind of just getting all of them within that little ecosystem that you built. And like you said, it's like a flywheel. They just it keeps turning and you get a lead, have a successful project, film an episode about it. I mean, that's just amazing. So I want to commend you for that because I think that's super awesome and what a goal of mine is. And then I think it's a good segue to talk about your newsletter the last kind of venture we had on that list in that intro. Talk about the newsletter. How has that been? How is being the author of a newsletter? Maybe because that I just opened up my newsletter for the podcast. So selfishly here would love to hear about your experience. You know, what's weird about the newsletter is it's so tough to get anybody to reply to it. And if you think about mm. like, when was the last time you replied to a newsletter? It's pretty rare. Like that yeah. format just doesn't, doesn't um, encourage people to reply to it. And so that has always, always disappointed me, always bothered me about having a newsletter is, but so much of content marketing really is just, you are screaming into the void. You know, like it feels like there's no one there and no one listening. Maybe a thousand people hear it or 5,000 people read it, like whatever it is, but it, you don't see it. You don't feel it. And so newsletter, I think is a little strange. What I like about it, I used to like write, write, and I'm not, I don't love writing. I don't think I'm a great writer. And that's what got me to the podcast is I'm like, well, it's easier than blogging, you know, <laughs> like pick the format that you, you like and excites you and you're good at. Like I like video. I like audio writing's rough, but I forced myself to do it. I'm like, I'm going to grind it out. And so I got way better. I developed a voice. And that, that helped a lot. And so I'd encourage people, if you're like, what's my voice? You know, that writing is how you work that out. Um, but with the newsletter, when it really started to work for me was when I had like a, a format to it, when I branded it, I call it Ecom Recon, weekly newsletter, same deal. It's like Very every cool. Tuesday. And it just came out of like, I would announce that like this episode is live. Here's the link. Here's what it's about. That was it. And it was every Tuesday. And then I was like, you know, I would get, I'm sure everybody subscribes to newsletters, but I'd get like one about um, electric vehicles from, you know, I think Bloomberg. And like it had this format where they'd say like news briefs and it'd be like three recaps and then like a longer article. And I thought, wait, why don't I, I could do that. You know, why not? 
And so I format it nicely. And then once I had that template, now it's a lot easier. And like, I just, yep. you know, I have a text file on my desktop that I just add throughout the week. I see stuff that's interesting and I just stick the, the link or note in there. And then on every Friday in the morning, I sit down and I'm like, okay, this is what I want to include. And I, you know, do a little summary, rewrite it or note what's important and then uh, put the, the newsletter together. And what's great about it, the newsletters is a reflection of like my continuing education. I'm like, all right, here's what was important to me this week, right? That's what you're doing. You're curating it. Because at the start of this episode, you're like, you know, you start to build a Shopify store and like you see people online and there's just all this advice. What do I do? Well, you experience one of the problems with what we do. You drink from the fire hose, right? There is yep. so much good info out there that how do you sift through it? And then there are not enough hours in the day, hands, money, time to be able to implement all of the advice you get. And many of it conflicts. And so you have to figure that out and commit. And so for me, like that newsletter is just kind of curating, like, all right, these are like the three things that I, I think will appeal to the audience, the majority, but this is all stuff that was interesting to me in the last seven days. Awesome. And then for anybody listening, I'll have that newsletter, the sign up sheet in the description for you guys to be able to sign up for that, if you thought any of this was interesting. Two questions I have for you um, asking for the audience. One, if what they heard today about the agency kind of fits what they're looking for, how do they go about getting in contact with you? And maybe what are some requirements? And then two, if there's somebody listening who's a huge e-com person who's been really successful on Shopify, how do they go about being a guest on your podcast? The All right, so for the, the agency, if your site is or will be on Shopify, there you go. I mean, that's the big requirement. <laughs> um, we do Shopify exclusively. And if you go to ethercycle.com, the big get started button or client application form, just fill that out. It's got a few questions and it goes to me and then uh, I'll reply to it. And we talk for 30 minutes and see uh, if it if it makes sense to work together. For the podcast, uh, if you go to the, the site, unofficialshopfypodcast.com, there's a guest application link. And so if you fill it out, stick your info, that will send it to me as well. And as long as you go like, hey, I just, you know, here's my brand and I want to share my story, my journey, or like, here's what I want to teach people. We'll probably say yes to it. You know, when we say no, it's like someone who's like, here's what I want to try to sell your audience. You know, they don't say it that yeah. way, but we know that's what's going on. So those are the ones we say no to. Got it. Got it. All right. Awesome. So for anybody listening, you know, go through, check out the um, agency website, book a call, see if it works for you. And then if you have an amazing Shopify story, make sure to get on Kurt's podcast and tell more people about it. As we come kind of to that tail end, I always like to ask one question at the end of every episode. And for multiple time viewers, you know where we're at here and you know the variety of answers we've received. If you're new here, this is something that is at the end of every episode. And that is, Kurt, what are you excited about in the near future? I am next month. I'm going to go to the Bahamas and swim with pigs. Okay. Gonna, a year ago, maybe it was like two years ago, I met a dolphin in the Bahamas. And his name was Sean. And my kids still talk about the time they met a dolphin named Sean. I'm hoping that we have a similar experience with swimming pigs. That's awesome. You got to come down um, here in Miami. We see dolphins about every time we take the boat out or, or get out on the water. So if you're ever lacking some dolphin, just come through here to Miami and you will be able to see a ton of them. But I love that answer. I love that. I love when people give me something personal. We talk business for 35 minutes here and it helps me learn a little bit more about you and let the audience learn a little bit more about you as well. Like that's something super exciting. I've not been to that part of the Bahamas. So I am looking forward to seeing pictures or anything that you upload when you do this. And I'm excited for you to kind of go have that experience. I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been an absolute pleasure. So many amazing nuggets of information for anybody listening. And then also, where can people follow you? Where are you most active? Um, all of that will be linked below, but I have to cater to the lazy people that won't even click the description and are probably just listening. If you're a Twitter person, I'm probably most active on Twitter, Kurt Inc, I-N-C, K-U-R-T-I-N-C. And then of course, you know, LinkedIn and we have a Facebook group as well. Awesome. Kurt, thank you so much again. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I look forward to this continued relationship and your growth. And I am super pumped for this episode to come out. Thank you for having me. My honor and pleasure.